um, what historical performance is, what Baroque music is, and what the tools are we use to. So, can you all hear me okay? We could, and now it's a little quieter. Is this better? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, so, we're hoping to get some uh, audience participation here occasionally. Um, does anybody, do any of the students know what historical performance is? No? That is great. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> um, so we, at Bourbon Baroque, we mostly perform music from the Baroque period. Has anybody heard of the Baroque period? You can like wave or not. Yeah, great. And um, so that's from about 1600 to 1750 in time. And, um, but historical performance ranges even before the Baroque period, like the medieval period and the Renaissance, which are even older than Baroque, through the 19th century. And, um, and so the 19th century, the 1800s. Um, so we can do historically informed performance of over 700 years of music. And each period, each country, each city sometimes has its own performance practices that are very individual to only some music that comes from that one little place. Um, I'm gonna be saying a lot of words that maybe not everyone is familiar with. So I just wanted to explain uh, if I talk about a Baroque orchestra, I am talking about uh, an orchestra that uses period instruments, which means that our instruments are a little bit different than what you all might play, and we'll, we'll go into that a little bit soon. Um, a Baroque orchestra, a period orchestra, and a historical orchestra are all basically the same thing. So we just, we try to perform music in the way that it was conceived during the time. So Bach had an idea to write a piece. We try to learn about that and then use the instruments that Bach had and then perform it in a way that maybe represents what Bach had in mind when he played it or when he composed it. Um, can anyone name some of the countries where a lot of Baroque music comes from in Europe? You're welcome to just. So you can either on. unmute yourself or write in the chat. France. Yeah, France. That's a big one. Any others? That's okay. We have France is huge. France has. France has a lot of very special music. There's also a lot of music comes from Italy, like Vivaldi would be from Italy, Germany, Bach was from Germany, and England. And um, so we've got all these great, those are the main countries. There are some other ones too. Um, and I just wanted to say for everyone, you know, we're speaking specifically about Western music here, but there are of course music, there's of course music from all over the world that um, has its own performance practices that can be researched and performed as well. Um, so I have a little slideshow for you all. It's very short, three slides. Um, can I share the screen, Sarah? While we're waiting for that, um, does anyone know about any instruments before what your instruments look like right now? Has anyone ever seen any really, really old instruments? Yeah, some, I'm gonna show you some, some pictures of them. So you should be able to share your screen now. I made you co-host. Can you all see this? 
All right. So here we have some medieval strings. Oh my gosh, we have to move these bows. Three bows, actually. So these are medieval strings and winds. And if you look on the on the right side, you can see some things that look kind of similar to a violin, right? We have a VL, which has four or five strings, kind of depends. We don't always know exactly. We have a, a Rebec, which is actually the direct um, predecessor to the modern violin or what we think of as the violin today. And the Rebec is fun because you actually hold it, you hold it down here to play it in your armpit. And you play like this on the Rebec and it only has three strings. But the reason it is the predecessor to the violin is because it's tuned in fifths, which is how we tune our instruments today. The VL has a lot of varied tuning. Um, it can be tuned in a num number of intervals. And then you have some others on the left. You have some uh, early trombones. Those are called sack butts. And then you have a lot of recorders and some crumb horns and some bagpipes and some sort of keyboard instrument down there and some early bassoons. So um, those are just some fun looking instruments that we don't get to see very often. And the bottom right is a group called Pifero and they're a wonderful historical wind band that you can look up. And next we have some Renaissance and a few medieval strings and wind. The left photo, all these instruments look pretty similar to things that we recognize today but the, the cello and then all the violin looking ones, that's actually a consort of violin family instruments. So there are two violins, there's a small violin and sort of a normal size violin. And then there are multiple sizes of viola. And then the thing that looks like a cello is actually a bass violin. And it's not tuned like a cello. Cello is not actually in the violin family. A bass violin continues tuning down and its lowest string is a B flat, which is pretty cool. And so French music often uses bass violin. And then you have some other recorders here, the gambas on the upper right. And then here we are at Baroque. And since neither Austin and I or I are a wind or brass player, I thought I'd share some photos of these instruments. So th these instruments are ones that we play with very frequently and that we have people come to Bourbon Brook to play with us. Um, in the upper left, we have the oboe family. So there's the regular oboe on the right, on the left, an oboe de more, which is sort of like an alto oboe, and then um, an oboe de caccia, which is the curved one, and that is a hunting oboe. And sometimes they have a metal bell as well, which is kind of interesting for a reed instrument and Bach wrote, writes for that instrument a lot. And then we have a French horn with no valves, it only you use only your lips. And we have a, a bunch of flutes on the upper right, those are all flutes. And they have very few or no keys, maybe one or two. We have Baroque trumpet, and then another kind of Baroque trumpet on the bottom right, which um, is like a, it's all coiled together and you can make it, it plays very, very high. And then we have Baroque bassoon and then uh, broke trombones on the bottom left. So, let's see here. I'm gonna talk, or I'm gonna let Austin talk a little bit about the keyboard in the Baroque period. So this is Austin. Hi guys. And he plays this instrument right here. I just wanted to make some, a comment on, just to build off of what Alice was saying. You'll see here we have the, Keyboard counterpart to the Baroque era. So I grew up studying the piano like most kids, right? I started when I was seven and I went off to college and I actually I sang in the Louisville Black Society, which used to be a choral group here in town. And I really enjoyed Baroque music and I just liked the way that the, the, the parts were composed and how everything was very mathematical and analytical, although I hate math. 
Um, I have a real good, although if you like math, that's totally fine. <laughs> but I'm more of an artsy kind of guy and I really fell in love with the Baroque. And I was like, how can I do the Baroque seriously and be like immersed in it and also utilize my keyboard skills that I've learned through uh, studying the piano? And the answer was the harpsichord, which is this instrument right here. Now, like I said, I was gonna make a correlation with what Alice was just talking about. Did anyone notice the predominant material in the instruments that you saw in those pictures? What was the most predominant material? I'll give you a hint. It's also predominant. <laughs> Anybody? The Italian is legno, L-E-G-N-O. You said in the chat, wood. Somebody answered oh. the chat. That's exactly what I was going for. Okay, so guess what? One thing, uh, historically speaking, when it came to the introduction of modern instruments, the instruments that you play today, there was a period in time in history where new materials were being made, which created bigger, stronger instruments, louder sounds, uh, instruments, materials that were used on instruments that you use today that create consistent sound from your upper register to your lower register. And that era in time was called the Industrial Revolution. So one other way we could describe the practice that we are involve ourselves in is any music prior to the Industrial Revolution, because that music had only some resources to build instruments. And not only that, but the acoustics and the concert halls that we performed in. So that's what our limitation was and in a way you can you can consider it a limitation from a modern standpoint but the, what we believe strongly is that there was a pure and very unique sound that was created because of limitations and because of that unique sound we our purpose is trying to reclaim that sound and try to go back in history and perform music the way handle Vivaldi, Bach would have composed and would have heard. Those audiences were trying to replicate that sound. And so that's, that's our love for this craft and this music. And then of course we have the harpsichord. When you play the piano, you, of course you have hammers that do what to the strings? What do the hammers do to piano strings? <laughs> right, there we go. We can do sign language. <laughs> Yes, they hit the strings, and for the harpsichord, uh, what happens is there's a there is a bridge here called a bridge, and underneath this bridge, I will show you if I can do this quickly. There are there's a mechanism called plectra, and we can take this bridge off, and you can see that instead of hammers. We have something called a row of plectra. And these guys right here have little things inside called plectra. You can look, where's the camera? Oh, uh, you can see this little plastic piece right here. That thing is called a plectra. It used to be made of bird quill. So you take the feathers off, you use the tip of that bird quill, and that's what that plastic was made of. Now we use plastic, of course. Um, but the, the sound that is created by the, by the keys, a uh, key hitting a plectra, as you can see, is a plectra plucking the string. And what that ends up doing is creating a very metallic sound. This specific instrument we have here is an Italian instrument. So it's modeled off the Italian brand. And you'll see that there is one manual here, like a piano. But one thing that's different than a piano is we've got way fewer keys. A piano has how many keys? That's right, 88 keys. <laughs> 88 keys. And this has considerably fewer keys. And they, they are around 60 keys per, per manual. A manual is also another term for a keyboard. And they'll vary by one or two different keys, depending upon 
where the instrument was made. So French keyboards are wider because they had longer ranges. Also, another reason is that their A actually was way lower than 440. It was all the way down to 392, so it was really, really low. And it creates very dark colors and very rich, robust. It's kind of emulated in their food, if you think, kind of think about it, it's very rich. And so this instrument has two sets of strings per note. So I can play one set of string, or I can double the strings, in which they're doubled right now. If I take one, you hear what happens? I'm taking one key and pressing it really, really slowly. Listen to what happens. That's one key. I'm pressing one key down. But when you press it with force, they sound together. And so you can turn off mechanisms here, levers that only plays one set of strings, or you can couple them and have two sets of strings play when you're playing. This is the quintessential thing that you can do to change dynamics in the harpsichord. The piano, as you know, the harder you hit the key, the louder it sounds. The softer, the softer it sounds. On a harpsichord, it's the same no matter how you touch it. It all has to do with uh, coupling or the number of notes you play. So this is your very, very quick and a uh, short tutorial on the harpsichord. Anyway, I think that's, we can move on Great. to that instrument. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Baroque violin now and try to make this a little bit more comfortable here. There we go. So, um, so uh, how many people play the violin here? Anybody? Oh yeah, well, go violin, that's great. <laughs> so I'm gonna hold up my Baroque violin and um, in the chat, or you can say it, um, let me know uh, what, what differences do you see since everyone's really familiar with the violin, okay? Ah, very good. Great. Yeah. Those are two of the really main things. And yeah, if I hold it like this, you can see the fingerboard a little bit better. No chin rest. This is, I play it exactly like this. No fine tuners. Yes. Um, no chin rest. The fingerboard is shorter. What else about um, the back do you see? This is exactly, no shoulder pad. That's great. Yeah. Now look really closely at my strings. I don't know if you'll be able to see very well. Can you see the strings? Can you see that they might look a little different? It might be hard to see this on, uh, on video. Does anyone have guess? Yeah, not metal strings, except this, my G string does have some metal on it. But the, the top three strings are made of gut, which is intestines from an animal. Um, if you're interested, you can YouTube gut string making and look into that yourself. <laughs> um, but so gut strings are very, very pliable and malleable, and they have a lot of give. And you know, on, on the E string on the violin, it's very, very tight and high. And it's like, ee! that's kind of what it feels like to me sometimes. This E string, I can tune it up above 440, higher than you tune your regular violin, and it won't break. It's pretty amazing. But if you try to tune your E string higher than 440, it won't last very long. <laughs> so these are made out of gut. This is the E, A, and D are made out of gut. And these are all pure gut strings. Sometimes there's a piece of metal inside a D string, which makes it heavier. So you get a lower sound, but without making it too fat because the heavier the string, the fatter it is, but if you can put some weight in there some other way. And then my G string is, has a gut, in, gut core, gut inside, and it's wound in silver, 
which was a technology that existed in the later Baroque period. Um, but they also didn't have air conditioning and heat. So it's helpful to have some more helpful things during the summer months, especially because gut strings go out of tune a lot because it's humid. So everything goes really flat. Um, and then just another very important thing. Who can tell me what's different about these bows? See if I can get them all here. Okay. I'll try to show you. There's the there are frogs. There are three bows here. There we go. Okay. Going down. Down. Yes, the frog is wood. What about the tip? So the frog, the frogs are made of wood. That's definitely, yeah, very pointy. Yes, exactly, exactly. So like this bow, if I tighten it even all the way, actually, it's very bowed out, right? Like we think of the word bow, meaning bowed, out, like a bow and arrow. Um, and then they all, none of them, have camber, like a modern bow. Camber is the thing that makes your bow dip down like this when you loosen it, which you do before we, when you put your violin away, right? Um, yes, so no ivory to weight it down. Sometimes there's, see a little piece of mammoth ivory in this bow. And this bow is super cool because they didn't have a screw mechanism. That didn't exist yet. If we're trying to, if we're trying to recreate music in in that way we try to use the same technologies when possible also air conditioning is not helpful for this but this bow has what we call a clip-in frog which i have this little piece of paper here because it, it there is no screw the way that you tighten the bow is you have multiple frogs and you change them out based on the season so you just take the frog out and then you can see there's a little place where it, the frog, oops, wrong side, fits into that little V, and then you just clip it back in, and that's how you tighten the hair. Otherwise, it just looks like a straight stick of wood. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about the Brogue violin, oh, I just wanted to make sure I, someone else said that the amount of space between the hair and the wooden part, exactly. So the bow at the frog has more space than at the tip, right? Between the hair, the wood and the hair. And that is the shape that the bow, that the bow makes when it plays. Ural's bows have sort of an equal amount of space between the frog and the, um, the wood, the hair at the frog and the hair at the tip. Um, and your bow makes a really great, very even sound that looks kind of like a long rectangle. And my bow makes, at the frog, it's loud and then it diminuendos, just like the shape of the bow. And that is exactly what they intended at the time. Okay, so now we are going to play some music. All right, we should do the rondo game. Right? Let's, we're gonna play the rondo game. We came up with a game for you all. Does anybody know what a rondo is? Yeah. I see some people nodding. So I know that some people know what, the, what a rondo is. Um, so we're gonna play the rondo game. A rondo is a form which has a repeating section. So if you were to label it, it would be A, B, A, C, A, something like that, right? So Austin is gonna play a rondo and we want you all to like raise your hand or, or do a little, um, reaction like that if you whenever yes. you hear the rondo theme i personally want to see a lot of thumbs when you hear the theme come in okay i will be very clear okay maybe even give you some roll and time to give you a heads up but i want to see thumbs more than anything because we can see thumbs and that's going to make me feel as though everyone's paying attention okay <laughs> Yep. Oh, look, my hands are on. That's so cool. 
So let me play the theme first. Here's the theme of this rondo. So that's the theme of this rondo. Now, here's the whole piece. Make sure to, to press your thumbs up when you hear it. <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, great. Everybody did such a good job with the rondo game. Um, we have we can play one more rondo piece for you, and you can practice some more with the rondo theme. This piece is by French composer, um, who uh, wrote a lot of operas. This is by Rameau, and it's um, it's from his opera Les On de Lant. And it's just from one section, and it's, it's a march, kind of. It's a march song. Is that good? Yeah, that's good. Maybe it's going to fall. It's impossible to play with. I'll still be able to hear you really well. Oh, okay. Yeah. So mute yours and I'll unmute mine. You should still be able to hear me somewhere, I'm told. I'm going to mute this and it will be better, better sound. Oh, oh, oh. Woo, girl. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can I Yeah. It's a little bit loud. It's a little bit loud.
How's that for tuning an E string with a thing? Great. Do your thumbs up again when you hear the theme come back, okay? I'll try to turn with my, we know this piece. Okay. Ready? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell us what that piece was. It was um, the. Oh, this was the. Shama dance from Les Sauvage. Yeah, this was a dance that uh, was done. It was kind of a, a native dance that was composed by. Am I on the right camera? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> composed by Rameau. Actually, this was a, a, a dance that Rameau composed along with some uh, native peoples from North America. And they, he was able to emulate the North American sort of tribal dance feel through this dance. And so this dance was a, uh, a, sh a chacon or a, a rondo form, obviously, uh, in a chacon setting uh, from the opera Les En Galant in one of the entrees. So like in a French feast, a big Baroque opera in France had several entrees like acts. Right? Yeah. Right. And since we are talking about dances, just one more thing that I think is really, really cool. Um, so many of the things that we play are dance forms, like bourre, gavotte, minuet, passe-pied, so many things. And they're all French. They come from France. And modern ballet, if any of you all do modern ballet, they... Uh, if any, if any of you all do modern ballet, they, all the words and terms for ballet came from French Baroque dance, which was very, very tied to French Baroque music. So, um, let's see here. Oh, the dance, yes. Yes, it's very important to share my screen to show you what 
French Baroque dance notation looks like. Look at that. So, as you can see, the notation, there are different, each step unit, the, that is one step on the left. And those little symbols tell you to do a number of things like um, go down and up and to raise your leg and to hop to one other leg um, in a certain order. And so Fouillet was a French man who is the person who invented this notation. And as you can see on the right, so there's a rigadon um, composed by Mr. Isaac. So this is not a French person probably, but maybe English. And then you can see the music across the top. And it's just the top line, but the music at the top goes with all the steps on that page. So when the dancers start and the musicians start, they end this page together. And then you go to the next page. So there's a lot to do in just a few bars of music. And when you're playing, when you're playing French Baroque music, especially a dance, you have to remember that there was a dancer who would have been dancing with you. So you have to do all the repeats because if you don't, the dance will be longer than the music. So that's why there are so many repeats in minuets and things. And I know a lot of times we like to leave out a repeat occasionally which you can decide to do that and that's okay, but you should know that the reason there are so many repeats is because of the dance. You want anything to add to that? If there isn't a dancer, you can do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but this, as this, this is a wonderful display. If you can follow my cursor, you see that this music at the top of this uh, dance notation proves to you right then and there. You can see in these resources, which is another reason why we love what we do so much is that we get to dig and find these absolutely gorgeous uh, plates and, and uh, images that prove that this Baroque music is steeped in dance form. So if you aren't moving, if the music isn't making you move or feel uh, rhythmic in some way outside of just making the notes, then you're not doing it right because this music was steeped and based in a foundation of dance, which is important. I think you're gonna play a at least maybe one dance for them. Yeah, let's play. So we're gonna play one one more thing for you. Um, we do. We can just we do one. We will do. You just wanna do the G or whatever. Let's do the um, the Murray. Okay. So has anybody played any of Suzuki Book Two? Yeah, some people have. Great. So you know Luli Gavat in Book Two. Anybody know that piece? You might recognize it. That piece is actually not by Luli. It was, it's by Marais, who was an, Lully was a French Baroque composer, but so was Marais. And Marais was pretty crazy. Lully was pretty reserved. And so I found the original Marais, which is for gamba, which is a bass gamba. So one that you play between your legs that has six strings or seven probably for France. And I transcribed it for violin. So it's in my range. And you'll, and you'll recognize it, and um, Austin and I will play it together. I wanted to show you all quickly before we. Oh, here we go. Can oh, I yeah, see? great. Okay. Uh, okay, can you see that? This is what I play from. It's just the bass line. So, all you pianists out there are used to seeing your right hand and your left hand, right? Well, what I have right here is just the left hand with, no with numbers above the notes. And what this is called is base figures or, or realization. So what happens is, is you've got the bass line and the, and, the, and the keyboardist would improvise the right hand with chords. And so um, sometimes you just get a bass line without numbers and you have to get really good at your music theory to figure out what you're supposed to do with the, with the chords and all. Um, then you can have numbers, which basically tells you the intervals above the bass line. And so I can, I can realize chords above this. Sometimes I'm really lucky and I get to have the melodic instrument above my part. And that really gives me a lot of information, a lot of clues as to how I'm supposed to realize my part without getting in the violinist's way or any other instrumentalist that plays above me. Because one of the worst things you can do, one of the worst things you can do is get in the way of your, of your soloist. <laughs> So I'm going to be very low and out of her way, right? 
We're going to do this. Is it Gavat? Lopi. How much money? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have any? Can you take maybe a few questions? Because yeah. I know some of the students are working on some Baroque pieces this week, and or just in general, I might have a few questions. Anybody? I have a question. Yeah. Um, does anybody locally, or do you guys teach Baroque dances and Renaissance dances? I I don't I have um, I have taken Baroque and Renaissance dance. Um, my violin teacher from uh, my doctorate is a Baroque dancer as well as a violinist, and um, I could possibly help somebody. <laughs> I don't know that I would call myself a teacher per se, but there are lots. There are YouTube videos, um, and I can try to put together a resource list that Sarah can maybe send out to everybody. You can look at some things because there's some really great Baroque dance videos that um, that you can see online on YouTube. There actually is uh, one of our uh, wherever I am here I am. Um, we have a a there's a there's a donor in town who gives Dean Carnes. Oh, yeah. There's this fabulous guy in town. I don't know whether he teaches, but you know. I think there probably would be an interest in having students learn some of these dances so they can really get it in their bodies when they're learning uh, their music. Um, but there is a guy who, uh, if you look up Baroque Dance and Dean Carnes, his name comes up because he's definitely been one of the contributors in academic uh, academia and books on Baroque Dance. And he happens to have retired and moved to Louisville. Um, so there might be an opportunity for us to, to work with him and create a workshop. I think that's definitely an option. It's really fun to learn, the, especially just the minuet step, and to understand how it fits with the minuet that you play. Because any minuet, you could dance a minuet to it. And there are things like one one minuet step, those, it, it takes two bars of music to play that. And how does that inform how you phrase something, you know? So we can, we can learn a lot from that kind of stuff. Does anyone else have any questions? You can type it or you can just ask. I have a question. So uh, this is more violin oriented, but I'm currently working on the second partita um, in D minor. 
And me and Miss Sarah have been talking about this, but specifically in the Star of Bond, I've been having issues like trying to figure out like an ideal Boeing that will like one technically be comfortable, but also place that like second the emphasis that is like normally typical in a star bond. Do you have like an idea of what a Baroque violinist would do with that beginning of the star bond in terms of like Boeing? Do you have um, the, the facsimile of the manuscript in your music? Do you have the Kreutzer edition with the facsimile in the back, the handwritten? Yeah. yeah. So I, when I play Bach, when I play solo Bach, I read from that. I don't, and it's okay if you, that it's, it's daunting, I know. <laughs> um, but what you can do is, what, what I would do is, I would just try to play it exactly as Bach wrote it at first. So I would go to the manuscript and I would, whatever bowings he did or did not include with slurs and things, I would try that just as it comes. And then maybe add a bowing here or there to make things feel kind of comfortable, you know? So like if you want to be down bow on a down beat, because that's a good beat and you want it to be heavy, um, you could do it up, up somewhere right before. And then three, a three meter, of course, you might, you have three beats, so that's uneven. Another thing to think about with the Cerebond is that the second beat is not necessarily accented. In a Cerebond, I don't know, let's see, I can try to explain via the dance step. Mm -hmm some dance steps. It's actually like a lifting. So if you have like one, two, three, you go one, two, three. And so you're sort of elevated and floating on the second beat as opposed to, it's not like one, two, three, you know? So it's one, you would dip right before one and one, two, three, and you're sort of floating over to the next downbeat. So in Baroque music, the downbeats are very important, and we always try to get to them. So you can think about the bowing in that way and how it helps you phrase to the next downbeat. There's no quick and dirty answer for that. Yeah. <laughs> every every Cerebon has its own little quirks, too. So each specific piece that you're playing that's, that's labeled a, a Cerebon has, has its own things, and you know, Obviously, you know, Alice is here as a, as a, as a Baroque dance uh, knowledgeable person and obviously with, the, with Baroque dance and French Baroque music and dance suites and she'd be happy to help you with any individual questions. I think it's always great to get different perspectives when it comes to learning your music so that you can make your own decision at the end of the day. Right. And that, that's so important to like just get all the information and then you can decide how you want to do it. Any other within question? reason, just joking. <laughs> I said within reason. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, that's no reason, whatever. Just whatever, you know. <laughs> I have a question, just really quick. Um, in addition to seeing Bourbon Baroque live, since we are able to do that, well, not at the moment, but in Louisville, at least when the times are safe, do you have other artist recommendations for the students to listen to? that deal with period practice? Yeah, there are a lot, there are a lot of um, groups out there. There are some here in America, there are a lot in Europe. Um, there's a, there are a few groups that I have played with before that I highly recommend listening to. One is Chatham Baroque, that's C-H-A-T-H-A-M Baroque, and they're based in Pittsburgh. And they're a trio, but they often will have other people as well. Um, and that, that group has a cool instrument called a theorbo, which is a giant lute. It's about seven feet long. You can see it in any of their videos. There's also Apollo's Fire, which is a group based in Cleveland. There is, um... Toffle Music in Canada. Toffle Music in Canada. Love them. They're great. They do a lot of very exciting things. There's Pifero, like I mentioned earlier, is a, is a medieval and renaissance wind band, P-I-F-F-A-R-O. There is um, a, another early, so there's another group called Quicksilver, which uh, my teacher plays in, which is great, my former teacher. And they often collaborate with 
a group called Dark Horse Consort. Make sure you search all three of those words. Um, <laughs> and they do a lot of early 17th century music. Um, I have another ensemble called Encantare, I-N-C-A-N-T-A-R-E. And we have, we play early 70s. Austin played with us once, and that was really fun. Um, it's really fun to see the uh, Baroque, you know, you can see, you can, sometimes it's like, oh, the Baroque music is so separate from what I do. I don't, there's no correlation, blah, blah, blah. Like there were separate entities that don't perform together, but it's really been exciting uh, to see like, any of you all enjoy opera or, or singing a uh, classical voice. You've, you've seen examples. If you follow the Met Opera at all, you'll see examples. They just did a wonderful uh, Handel's Agrippina where they hired Baroque vocalists, specialists in Baroque music, and had a pit of Baroque uh, instruments uh, where the harpsichord was even featured on stage. And they created a wonderful modern interpretation of Baroque music. Because as you can imagine, these people 300 some odd years ago had brains and were social just as much as we are now. And so uh, what modern groups are doing nowadays are, are creating modern interpretations with the Baroque mindset, with the Baroque resources, to try to tell, tell the stories, the old stories in a modern way, which is really exciting. So I know the Met Opera is somewhere where you can see like actual Baroque opera in a modern way, which is fun. Um, and obviously there's Indianap Indianapolis Baroque oh. is, is your closest yeah. orchestra. They just came out with a CD that I'm playing on, which is super cool. So in the Indie Baroque, Indianapolis Baroque Orchestra is. Right. And a lot of their members play here with us. So if you ever come to one of our concerts, you'll see a lot of Indie Baroque people as well. The easiest thing you can do is get on Spotify and look up your, your, your radio stations and look up Baroque. For the most part, you'll get period interpretations. And if we ever had another time to maybe to, uh, to um, be in a class with you all, we could juxtapose a modern interpretation next to a Baroque interpretation to see the differences in, in performance practice. I will say I am not a purist. I love playing Bach on the piano just as much as I like to play it on the harpsichord. There are different things that an instrument can provide for, your, for the music. Um, I think if you use a sustain pedal, if you're a modern, if you're a pianist out there and you play Bach, I think there is no, there's nothing wrong with using a pinch, just a pinch of sustain pedal in your playing. Because I believe, for example, the, the, the sustain pedal is a harmonic device. If you're gonna be creating this cloud of G minor over several measures, why not bolster that effort by putting a little sustain in there to create some sound? Utilize the instrument for what it's worth. If you just don't use something because you're trying to be a harpsichord, well, that would be like, that would be like driving uh, a Tesla, like a Volvo 240. Why would you do that? You know, you gotta use your instrument for what it's worth. And it's completely fine to utilize different aspects of the harpsichord and try to be a harpsichord, but utilizing the um, assets you have, like the pedal and uh, the range and the touch, there's, there's things you can do. The harpsichord for me specifically has taught me that, you know, they didn't have a pedal back then. So everything was controlled by your hands. You had to sustain what you needed to sustain. You had to create everything with the touche, the French word touche. And so everything had to be created with your hands. So if that's the case, then you take your Baroque music. The first thing you do when you're learning Baroque music on a piano is create it with your hands first then you can utilize aspects of the piano and say, well, welcome to heaven. Now you have a pedal. And it's great because you can use your hands first and really center in on your hand technique and make that above all the, the they always, in the harpsichord, when you're playing on the, on the keyboard, you can actually feel the pluck when you're playing the, the, the uh, keys. And because of that, your fingers almost feel like they're on the strings. That's why it's called a harpsichord, harp. You know, so it's really exciting to be able to, to have this practice, this knowledge, and then use it on modern, because I know Alice does that when she plays with the, the LO or when any other modern orchestra, she's able to 
utilize her smarts and, and ways and become a versatile musician. Because I think, wouldn't it be great if one of all of our goals was to be able to approach music in informed ways so it's not just all the same, rather we have this big palette of, of ways that we can interpret things, I think. Yeah, right. and, and going along with what Austin is saying about, you know, playing on the piano or playing on the harpsichord, it's the same for the violin. Like, if you don't have a broke violin or a broke bow, that's okay. You can still inform yourself as to phrasing, heavy, um, like good and bad beats, so heavy and light, and things you can do to, to use the instrument you have in an informed way, because it's not wrong to play Bach on modern violin either. That's perfectly okay and um, yes especially you know do if any if any violinists ever have more questions about or want to even try my violin I'm sure Sarah and I can make that happen somehow <laughs> so um, do we have any other questions Good. Good. Yeah. Thank you all so much for sharing today and playing and uh, so many awesome things that, that we got to learn together. So thank you. Thank, thank you for you having us. So yes, Thanks thank for you. having us, guys. Enjoy that rain. It's pouring outside. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. See you Bye. all.